Let's invite our speaker for this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the Word of God that is in our language, where you could speak to us and we would comprehend the length and breadth and depth and height of your love. I want to thank you for the worship that we are able to give in every language and in any language. I thank you that it is acceptable to you because the blood of Jesus Christ has torn open the veil of the temple and we are able to run up right to the mercy seat to get from you the mercy and the grace that is required for our lives. Lord Jesus, there are some people here that have been battling illnesses this morning, this past week. There have been families that have been unwell. I pray for healing. Here in your presence where Satan has no, no dominion and all bondages, bonds are broken, all bondages is broken. Lord, in your presence I ask and I request for healing. Jehovah Rapha, speak the word and healing will be uh, administered to every home, to every individual. Me <coughs> mental illnesses, emotional hurt and pain, broken heartedness, physical duress, even families that have received word that there's cancer in the home or in the family member. Lord, that kind of comfort only you can give. Father in heaven, would you see, speak into our families, into our marriages, into our relationships, those which are hanging on by a thread, those who are, which are hurting and, 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 and need your repair, need your healing. A soft voice from you, a word from into one of the hearts to soften a heart, or oh God, wisdom to deal with a teenager or to deal with a two-year-old, whatever it is, oh God, you are the one who knows what we need. You are the shepherd. We can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be found wanting. Father God, you are the God who we come to Sunday after Sunday because you have what we need. You have what it takes. You have the promises that we base our lives on. Lord, there are people listening to me, watching me online right now. There are people who have taken the trouble to be here this morning. Make it worth their while by sending them home with something so concrete, solid, practical, and relevant that they would be able to live this week stronger and enjoy you more. Because that's the end of our life. That is the goal of our life, to enjoy you. To get from you everything that you have to offer to us. To be satisfied in you. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We worship you. We lift your name. We exalt you. We give you the glory. We give you all the praise. Everything that, we, that is within us cries out to you in worship and thanksgiving and adoration. Speak, speak, Lord, so clearly that it will be without a shadow of a doubt that people will know that they have heard from you this morning. And if it be your will, which I know it is, there's anybody here who has never accepted Christ into their hearts, into their will, and given them the throne, given you the throne of their life. There's someone who has yet been holding out and doesn't want you to take over their life. Lord, today, the 8th of December, may it be the day that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that the Spirit of God enters their home, and Lord, their salvation comes to their home. This is my prayer to you. With every faith that you answer the kind of prayers that are within your will, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we're in the 10th part of the book of James. We've been studying the book of James. It's been, and if you have your Bibles or if you have your phones, your, the Bible on your phone, whatever it is, uh, let's find ourselves in James chapter 5. Today I'm going to look at a bulk of James chapter 5. But Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Our biggest hurdle... Welcome everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are, whenever you are watching this. May the Lord bless you. Our biggest hurdle in life is, you're not listening to me, is distraction. <laughs> Our biggest hurdle in life is distraction. But God wants you to finish well. God wants you to finish strong. Let's do that again. Our biggest hurdle in life is distraction, the lack of focus. <clears throat> but God wants us to finish well. God wants us to finish strong. I've been preparing a revenge for my enemies. For everyone who came in my way, for everyone who tripled, uh, tripped me up, for everyone who robbed from me, for everyone who betrayed me, for everyone who took my place, for everyone who cut me off, for everyone who slowed me down, for everyone who thought they got better of me, for everyone who, who, who loved me, left me, whatever. I, my revenge is I'm going to finish well. 
I am going to finish well. I'm determined to finish well, no matter what comes my way. Trauma, disappointments, failures, betrayals, plans falling through. Have your plans ever fallen through? People failing me. Have people ever failed you? Sickness. Nothing will hinder me. Nothing will distract me. Nothing will dissuade me. Nothing will discourage me. I'm going to finish well and I'm going to finish strong. God wants you to finish strong and he is doing, going to do everything he can to help you do that. Why? Why do I want to finish strong? Why am I so sure I'm going to finish strong? Because I believe in myself? No. It's because Jesus has given me power to live on and a promise to look forward to. Jesus has given me power to live on, to power through, to power through, to get up and to move through all of that. To get up again, to power through whatever comes in my way. To have endurance, to not get tired, to be able to keep at it. And he's given me the promise that when I get to the other end, he's going to be there. He's going to be there. He's going to be at the other end. And he's promised me that I'm going to get to the other side. Do you remember the Lake of Galilee? In the lake, lake of Sea of Galilee? Jesus said, get into the boat. They got into the boat. There were winds. There were storms. There was all sorts of opposition. But we said, we're going to the other side. Which means we're going to go to the other side. When Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side, we're going to go to the other side. If Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side, we're going to go to the other side. He's on my team. He's committed to me. And he's going to see me through. He's going to see you through. Trusting is worth it because he's going to see you through. Endurance is worth it. Forgiving is worth it. You're like, no, I can't give my life away. I'm going to lose my identity to people. I'm going to lose my stuff to people. I'm going to lose a bit of myself if I, if I just forgive and let people off the hook. I don't, no, no, you, it is worth it. It is worth running free. You get the picture? It is worth running free. No shackles. No burdens, nothing holding you, not, no baggage, no bondage, no shackles. It is worth forgiving. It is worth loving, loving still. Still I will love you. Even though I will love you. Instead I will love you. In spite I will love you. He has promised to make it count in the end. Jesus is so committed to you and so, so wanting for you to finish well. That he wants you to move from 2019 into 2020. He wants you to move from 2019 into 2020, not with lessons learned, but with promises believed. Not with lessons learned, but with promises believed. The lessons you learn is, I can't do it. People are like that. Life is like that. This will happen. That will happen. I can't trust anybody. I can't depend on anybody. Those are the lessons you learn from the experiences. He says, put that away. Live, live on a promise. We live on the promises of politicians. We'll elect the same fellows all of it again because we believe in the promises. Because promises gives us hope. There is a hope of some change. There's a hope of greater development or, or advancement. We live on hope. We are, we are driven by hope, not from lessons learned. You don't live stronger because you're wiser. You live stronger because you're more faithful, because you're trusting more. So when you think about the future, when you think about change, when you think about 2020, you're saying, Lord, you're in 2020. You're at the, 2020, uh, at the end of 2020. You are there for me and you are with me, not against me. Here are three ways to finish strong. James gives you three ways to finish strong. I'm going to go so fast that you'll miss it if you blink. All right? And I've not given you notes so that you take your own notes today. Number one, keeping my eyes on Jesus... Jesus' return, keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will help me to be patient. Will help me to be patient. Why don't you go ahead and write all three points down so that we are not wasting time. You can just listen to my heart and we can close this deal. All right. Number one is keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will help me to be patient. This is like third standard. This is good. It's like dictation. The second assurance or promise Three ways to finish strong. The second one is keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will build a faith that lasts. Will build a faith that lasts. And number three, what is the third thing that will come your way if you keep your eyes on Jesus? Focus. 
Keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will enable me to keep my word. It will enable me to keep my word. Let's go back to the first one. You're very smart. This is good. You've taken down everything. Now you won't be distracted. Now you can listen, to your, listen with your heart. Go back to verse 7 of chapter 5. Okay, verse 7 of chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. That's two times James says, until Jesus comes, until he comes back. So we have an end in mind. Look at me. Listen to me. We have an end in mind. We are not running to finish our race. We are running to start a life. We are not running to finish a race. We're running to start a life. When Jesus comes, that's when our life's going to begin. Everybody else is waiting for success. We are waiting for the Lord's return. We are different to everybody else. They are wanting and waiting for something to succeed when they get that house, when they get married, when they get that, that degree, or when they get that situation or that promotion success is always something that working towards and once it comes it goes once it comes it goes but we keep our eye on the finish line which is the person who is saying come come my way don't 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 give up come on you can do it come on you can do it oh don't worry about that forgive them keep moving keep moving don't don't go don't give up don't stress out you can do it few more minutes few more you can do it and he's at the finish line beckoning you to come. And as you keep your eyes focused, peeled on Jesus, you're like, I'm coming, Lord. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish strong. And everything that comes your way is just a hurdle, just a chapter, just something that happens in your life. It is not your life. It's totally different in the way we see life. Keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will help me be patient with the people, the things, the delays, and the distractions in my life. Verse 7, be patient. Brothers, he's talking to his own believers. Until the coming of the Lord. Why? Think about a farmer, for instance, as an example. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. Be like that. Be patient. Because how is a farmer patient? A farmer knows once he sowed the seed, once he's watered the ground, he has to sit back and most of his life is out of his control. He understands that. He's not trying to make it grow. He's not talking to the plant. He's not working through it. He's not taking credit for everything that happens. He knows that most things that happen in life are not under his control. He sows the seed. He waters his plants. He sits back. And when the crop comes, he takes credit for it. He enjoys the crop of it. And that patience is what God is asking us to have. Why? Because God is at work in your life. God is at work in your life. Things don't just happen. When things happen, He will make it work for you. He is committed to you. He loves you. He wants to know what He can do. He wants you to know what He can do if you sit back and trust Him on the things that He only can do. He wants you to know that if you do what you've done, he will take it from you. He will pick it up. He will finish the task. He wants to see you at the other end. So he has promised to make it count. That big disappointment that you've been thinking about nonstop, he's promised to make it count in your favor. Those losses that you have incurred, he's promised to make it count in your favor. Why? Why does God want to do that? What is the point of it? Pastor Jeremy, are you just inspiring us with some positive words here? Are you just making us feel like everything will be okay in a blind sense? No, because God is committed to you finishing. If you get distracted like a two-year-old that trips and falls and lines stands there, hey, life is over, everything's over. It's, it's just like a two-year-old. Some 16-year-olds also do it, but they're just lying there. And until somebody comes and picks them up and gives them a candy, they don't want to move on. Are you like that? You're not like that. God wants you to be mature, to be up and about, to, be, to jump back on your feet and say, that was not my life. That's just a thing that happened with me. And it's okay that it happened with me. Somebody ditched you, it's okay. Move on. Somebody betrayed you, it's okay. Move on. There's an eternity to live for. Somebody robbed from you, it's okay. They didn't, they, somebody will rob from them. There's nothing that goes away that doesn't come your way. And that is nothing that comes your way that's not going to go away. You will take nothing with you, not even the body you have so loved your whole life. Not even your body. And the only thing that you will take with you, which is your spirit, 
you and I give very little credence to. We give very little nourishment to. We give very little love to. What is my point? God is committed to seeing you finish because when you hit the finish line and come through, there's a life waiting for you. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You thought you got life when you were born. You thought this is your life. But when you finish your life, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life in abundance. He wasn't talking about life on earth. He was talking about an eternity that as soon as you finish the race and you walk into heaven, you are ushered into that life. He said, come, my son, enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. He has given you eternal life. That's a life that goes beyond death. That goes beyond death. All of us see death as something so terrible. So terrible. We see death as the end. We mourn over death. Death is nothing to God. He has allowed so many people to die. You say, how can he allow people to die? Because he knows something you don't. He knows something I don't. Because when babies die, or young people die, or old people die, they step off the merry-go-round. They step out of time and into eternity. There is something greater and bigger that God holds greater value to than this life. So obviously he doesn't value this life as much as he values that life. So he's saying to you, while you're in this life, play the merry-go-round, do your thing, be faithful, don't give up, come my way, come my way. Can you see the light? Come my way. Stay focused, see the light, come my way. Get up, get up. Don't lie down. Don't do this. Don't rest. Don't give up. Come my way. And as you come stronger and you move through the doors of eternity into time immemorial you will see life god promises you that and that's why he wants you to get up and move that's why he's going to give you the strength to move on that's why he does what he does keeping my eyes on jesus is what 2020 is all about keeping my eyes on jesus is what life is all about and it enables you to be patient with the people who are tough to be patient with you know The EGR people, extra grace required. The second assurance, he says, is keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will build a faith that lasts. Will build a faith that lasts. Because when you get in a car and you decide to drive to Nagpur, you're okay. Because there are petrol pumps along the way. You could stop. But when you get on a plane and you want to fly across the Atlantic, right? you want to make sure there's enough fuel to get you there. There are no stops. There are no stops. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to... Ah, no, that's not going to work. God wants you to have a faith that will last a lifetime. Did you hear me? So he's going to invest in the thing that's most precious to him. The thing that's most precious on a plane is fuel. Not cushion seats. I know you thought cushion seats, but it's not cushion seats. It's fuel. You would rather have fuel than a cushion seat. God wants you to... At the end, he wants to meet you at the finish line. He wants to see you through to the end. And he is committed to that, which is why he will put everything on the line, including his son, to make it happen. Keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will build my faith that lasts. Build a faith that lasts. That's why he uses the phrase in verse 8. He says, establish your hearts. In verse 7, he says, be patient. Be patient. Be patient. The second thing he says is, establish your hearts. What does that mean? Go, go back this week, write it down on a piece of paper, put it on your pin board and say, Lord, until I understand what this phrase means, I'm not going to rest. Establish your heart. What does it mean? There's obviously something in there that will get me through the most painful seasons of my life. It will get me through the most hardest issues of my life, loneliest moments of my life. Something there that God thinks will get me through to the finish line. I better give my faith some credence. He has, com- he has promised to make it count and he's committed to your faith because his, your faith is more precious to him than your gold. Number three, he says, keeping my eyes on Jesus' return will enable me to keep my word. Allow me to read the whole passage, then we'll get to the end, all right? Do not grumble against anyone, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So you don't grumble and judge somebody because the moment you judge somebody, the doorbell is going to ring and our judge, sir, is going to walk right in. So hold your judgment. Got it. Verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, we've already covered suffering, we've covered patience in James. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of God. So here's another example. One was farmers. Another is 
Prophets, look at the prophets. They hung in there, man. They hung in there. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, that guy for instance. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord come through for the guy. How the Lord was compassionate and how he was merciful. God is compassionate and God is merciful. So it is worth it. It is worth it. It will count. He will make it count. It's worth hanging in there. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let, say it, let your yes be loudly. Let, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Let's talk about that for a minute. You know what that means? If you're going to make it to the end, you've got to be steadfast and consistent. So what you say yes to, you've got to stick with. And what you say no to, you've got to stick with. You can't say no, change it to a yes. You can't say yes to something, change it to a no. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Is that a priority? Is that a command of God? Is that a purpose of God in your life that you're saying no to? Every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. Is that a priority? Is that a purpose of God? Is that a command to obey? Every time we say yes to something, we want to stick with it. Every time we say no to something, we want to stick with it. If you're going to finish it and go to the end, you need to meet the commands. You need to say no to what you should say no to. God will give you the strength to do that. And you need to say yes and stick to your yes in what you say. He's not just saying, you know, uh, we'll come for dinner. Ha, I'll come for dinner. Oh, sorry, yaar, wo, you know, puncture ho gaya, yaar, sorry. He's not talking about that yes and no. Although it does help. It does help if, you say, if your yes is a yes, you know. So what he's saying as we close this is that whatever it takes to get you to the finish line, Whatever it takes to help you finish strong, God is vested in you. God is committed to you. Jesus will put every last bit of energy and angel to the work to help you get to the finish line. Why? Because that's where he is. That's where he is. He's standing there at the finish line. Come, come, you can do it. Get up again. Stop crying. Shut up. Hey, stop crying. Come on, come on, you can do it. Come to, come, come to me. Come. And we move in life, we victor in life, we triumph in life because we keep our eyes on Jesus. Not on the problem, not on the betrayer, not on the thief, not on the circumstance, not on the dollar, but on Jesus. He will back you up with strength for your yes and for your no. He will help you stick to your yeses. God has given you the Holy Spirit to coach you just to tell you, you could do it. You can move it. What's going to be your attitude in 2020? What's going to be your attitude? Are you going to move in from 19 to 2020 with lessons learned or with promises believed?